Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Vitchers, the Executive Director of It's On Us. Thank you so much for joining today's Mental Health Roundtable, um, which is our second event uh, today for Tuesday for our spring week of virtual action. Um, we appreciate everybody joining us. Um, just before we get started, I did want to just provide a trigger warning. Um, our work is focused on sexual assault prevention and survivor support, um, and there may be discussions of sexual violence during the course of today's uh, mental health roundtable. Um, so please just be aware of that. Um, we are going to be putting into the chat box um, just some resources in case anybody needs access um, to any support services during or after this conversation. Um, also, this conversation is being recorded. Um, so if you do need to step away for any reason, um, we will be sharing the recording of this uh, conversation uh, first thing next week at the end of our spring week of action. Um, and so with that, uh, again, I'm Tracy Vitcher, the Executive Director of It's On Us. Um, I am so excited to introduce you to the participants in today's Mental Health Roundtable. Um, the panel today is being moderated by Ross Sabo, the Wellness Director at Geffen Academy at UCLA. He's a mental health speaker and, a, and the CEO of Human Power Project. Uh, Sabo was the Director of Outreach for the National Mental Health Awareness Campaign from 2002 to 2010. In that time, he helped create the first nationwide youth mental health speakers bureau in the country called The Herd, which was later acquired by Active Minds. He spoke to over 1 million young people and reached millions in media appearances. Uh, he was also awarded the 2010 D.D. Hearst Erasing the Stigma Leadership Award, and, has, and his work has entered into the congressional record uh, by Congressman Patrick Kennedy. Um, Ross is also known for being one of the most sought-after mental health speakers in the country, co-authoring Behind Happy Faces, Taking Charge of Your Mental Health, A Guide for Young Adults, and creating a mental health curriculum also titled Behind Happy Faces. The curriculum is currently being used by over 200,000 students across the country. Uh, the Behind Happy Faces mental health curriculum received the 2016 Excellence in Education Award from the Association of Fraternity Sorority Advisors. Uh, his work at the Gaffin Academy at UCLA is to create a comprehensive mental health curriculum that follows the milestones of adolescent development for grades 6 to 12. Um, so Ross, thank you so much for being willing uh, to moderate today's conversation. We're so excited to have you. Um, he has been a long-standing partner of It's On Us, and so we're so glad that he keeps accepting our <laughs> invitations to come back for our virtual events. Um, today we are also joined by Aurora James. Um, She's a Toronto native and New York City transplant. Uh, Aurora is the creative director and founder of the luxury accessories brand, uh, Brother Vies, uh, founded in 2013 with the goal of keeping traditional African design practices and techniques alive, while also creating sustaining artisanal jobs. Um, it is now handmade across the globe. Prior to founding her company, uh, Aurora amassed an impressive resume of industry experience. Her background in fashion, journalism, art, music, photography, and horticulture joins a forever passion for artisanship, design, Design and humanitarianism, humanitarianism to create truly one-of-a-kind pieces you'll have in your wardrobe forever. Uh, in May 2020, James launched the 15% Pledge, a nonprofit urging major retailers to allocate 15% of their shelf space to Black-owned brands in the fight for economic equality. Aurora, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy to have you as part of the discussion. Uh, we are also joined uh, by our dear friend Nadia Akamoto, uh, who I have been on previous panels with before. Um, Nadia is a 23-year-old Harvard student. Uh, in early 2020, um, she co-founded August, a lifestyle brand working to reimagine periods. As the Today Show describes, August is a growing online community aiming to reimagine and redefine the period experience to be powerful and dignified with members who engage in conversations about how to properly use menstrual cups or what it's like to be a transgender man having a period, for example. Nadia is also the founder of of period, period.org, an organization fighting to end period poverty and stigma that she founded at the age of 16. Under her leadership as executive director for five years, period addressed over 1.5 million periods and registered over 800 campus chapters in all 50 states and 50 other countries. In 2017, Nadia ran for public office in Cambridge, Massachusetts at age 19, at that time becoming the youngest Asian American to run. 
In 2018, she published her debut, debut book, Period Power, a manifesto for the menstrual movement with the publisher Simon & Schuster, which made the Kirkus Reviews list for best young adult nonfiction of 2018. Nadia is also the former chief brand officer and current board member of Juve Consulting, a Generation Z marketing agency based in New York. She has been recognized on the list of Forbes 30 Under 30, Bloomberg 50 Ones to Watch, and People Magazine's Women Changing the World. Nadia, so excited to have you here with us today. Um, we are also joined today by Nia Su. Uh, Nia has entertained fans across the globe since the age of nine as an original cast member of Lifetime's docuseries Dance Moms. Nia has continued to evolve as an entertainer in music as well as on stage, television, and film. Uh, she recently completed a multi-year run on CBS Daytime Soap The Bold and the Beautiful, had her own Nickelodeon digital series, and the lead in Brat TV's digital series, Sunny Side Up. One of her greatest joys is when she was cast as a featured performer in the off-Broadway musical Trip of Love. Shortly after, Nia went on to star in her first film, Running From My Roots, and has appeared in two more films, The Code and The Lies I Tell Myself. Nia was chosen to host the 2018 Winter Olympics as an NBC correspondent and has furthered those skills by hosting multiple red carpets. Meeting Michelle Obama and speaking at the Reach Higher College Signing Day at UCLA was a life-defining moment for Nia. Uh, for folks who don't know, Reach Higher used to be uh, a partner organization with It's On Us. Um, she has also worked with When We All Vote, which is another one of our sister projects here at Civic Nation uh, as a youth ambassador where she's been able to participate in activism on a variety of levels. Nia's talents have been recognized when she was named favorite 19 under 19. Nia recently released her first children's book Today I Dance in January. With over 13 million followers across several social media platforms being a good role model is important to Nia. She regularly speaks star in their own lives, which is a great way of talking about it, a message dear to her. Uh, Nia started a weekly role model Monday tribute on her social media to recognize those who are making a change. She's passionate about a variety of issues, including but, in not, but not limited to social justice reform, gender equity, voter registration, body positivity, and anti-bullying. Nia recently graduated high school last spring and attends U UCLA virtually as a freshman. Um, she is currently based in LA, but frequently is home in Pittsburgh. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, we are in, joined by Sydney Kim, um, who is one of our It's On Us student leaders. Um, Sydney is a senior majoring in health science and minoring in applied human development at Boston University. She plans on applying to law school after completing her undergraduate education and would like to study medical or criminal law. Sydney is a passionate and zealous advocate for issues such as sexual assault, mental health, and juvenile justice. During her time at BU, she serves as the president and co-founder of It's On Us, has worked as a sexual assault response and prevention, or SARP ambassador, and a peer academic coach for Boston University students living with mental health disabilities. In her free time, Sydney likes to write memoirs, paint, and travel around the world. As a Korean American who lived in Singapore for 16 years, Sydney can speak English, Korean, and Mandarin. That is very impressive, Sydney. Um, I'm very lucky that I can speak my one language properly. Um, she continuously is looking for ways to connect with people from diverse backgrounds and hopes to learn more languages in the future. Um, so with that, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Ross uh, to facilitate the rest of our conversation. All right, thanks so much. Uh, what a powerhouse group of women. It's amazing to be here with you and to have this conversation. You know, mental health has been such a huge topic during the pandemic and before it. Our country really is in uh, a mental health crisis. And so I think it'll be really great to hear your experiences, uh, what's going on, and, and even some advice that you can offer. So Kind of first question I want to cover is just at a starting point, like what are some of the biggest causes of stress in your life and, and how do you manage those causes of stress? Uh, I think we'll stick with the way you were introduced just to start. So Aurora, you want to kick us off with the uh, causes of stress and how you manage them? Yeah, sure. I mean, this past year, suffice to say, has obviously been insanely stressful for everyone. And I think for me, um, it's really been about finding a balance on how to cope with new world order and working from home and being on back-to-back -back Zooms, um, but then also not feeling too much pressure to not take time to acknowledge that this whole situation that we're in right now is actually just super hard. 
Um, and I think really early on, you know, when we were all staying home and trying to figure things out, it was like, you know, we felt this pressure to make the most of the moment that we had, you know, and I think more and more that whole idea of making the most of everything um, is sort of weighted on all of us at the same time that self care is weighted on all of us. And for me, it actually got to a point where I felt stressed out about not taking enough time to do stress, to do stress management, i.e. self-care. And self-care became this other thing that was on my list of to-dos that I had to check off that I then had to feel guilty about not having enough time to do. And what I realized for myself, my actual breakthrough moment was that sometimes for me, self-care isn't a facial, isn't a meditation. It's literally just about doing nothing and feeling great about doing nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean like, sitting down and just clearing my mind or like watching some TV show or documentary. And so for me, I think taking the pressure off of myself to perform or overperform or be super happy all the time during a global pandemic was like the best thing that I could have done for myself. Because I think ultimately for all of us, just getting through this moment is a huge triumph and a huge win and something that we all need to be proud of ourselves for. Yeah, that's a that's a really great answer, especially as such like an overachiever, um, you know, and so many expectations on you as well, like just giving yourself that break, that acknowledgement is, is so important. Uh, Nadia, how are you? What are your causes of stress? How are you managing them? Um, I would say, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, to be honest, I feel like I'm on here and still figuring out like my stress management. I think that like I won't even say that I've accomplished a sort of work-life balance because I think right now I'm just kind of trying to get through the moment in a lot of ways, if I'm being honest. Um, I think for me, you know, my causes of stress range from balancing my senior year of college and um, I'm closing up seed round for my new company this week. Um, and, you know, kind of just trying to balance life um, and everything there is with that. But also I think that there's the stress that comes with being a young Asian American woman, like in today's world, like if you care about like intersectional feminism and racial justice, like this is not a relaxing time to exist in, right? I think the last year has really shown this overdue cultural reckoning of, um, you know, really, really seeing the issues at hand that we're living amongst. And, um, you know, I think the rise in anti-Asian violence and kind of this highlighting of, um, like identity in this world and I think for me like the last year has been a lot of unlearning and learning and um, honestly like feeling imposter syndrome with kind of uh, the platform that I do have and wanting to do like as much as I possibly can around this issue that I care deeply about um, and mental health has been a big focus for me um, in the last year. I spent actually several weeks in a residential rehab center last year specifically for PTSD um, and trauma from growing up with sexual violence. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely been a big year of, of really having to face a lot of things and processing them um, after several years of running away from it at all costs um, through work and everything. And so, yeah, just really honored to be here and, and excited to learn from everybody. I mean, I think Nadia, that the the some of the most important things you brought up there are the intersectionality, right? So, being a young woman, uh, your your racial identity, your gender identity, um, you are like doing a lot of big things in the world, but then you do have your own story, your own journey through mental health as well. I, I appreciate your honesty and being willing to admit what you've done because so many people wouldn't even just say what you said. They they'd see that outside ex external appearance of you meeting all these levels that they want to meet and they wouldn't acknowledge what you did. So thank you for your, your strength and, and just being honest about that. Uh, Nia, any causes of stress with like being a freshman remote learning while trying to like be an activist in every single category possible? <laughs> Yeah, well, first, I honestly just wanted to tell everyone that it's an honor to be chatting with you guys and to be on this panel with you all because you all are amazing and already like, oh, wow, just hearing about the way you guys handle stress is really cool. So it's really an honor to be able to be on this with you guys. Um, 
And I wanted to just like agree with Aurora and Nadia how there's so much to be stressed out about whether um, social injustices going on the, um, around the world or even just trying to make the most out of everything, you know? Um, for me, as you know, a first year college student, I struggle a lot with imposter syndrome and feeling like I don't belong where I'm at, even though, you know, I, I've studied for hours, have trained, you know, have done all these things to get me to where I am. I still sometimes believe that I don't deserve it or I'm not ready for it or, um, you know, just always, I don't know, in a way degrading myself when really it's like, girl, like you earned it. And sometimes it's hard for me to, it stresses me out. I don't know. I feel like that adds a layer of stress to my life. And although it's not, um, I feel, well, I would say a lot of people probably go through it, especially first years. I'm actually like in this first year scholars program at UCLA where a lot of us, um, we're all first years and we talk about um, how we're feeling and getting adjusted, especially online uh, to the online learning system. But that's a huge one. And also I've always been a perfectionist my whole life. I've always felt like, and that probably, <laughs> that's my um, imposter syndrome stems from being a perfectionist. But um, my whole life, I've always just wanted to please other people. And it stresses me out that I can't make everyone happy. And I have to take time for myself to just like not do anything and realize that I, you know, I try my best, but I, I cannot, I, I, I can't make everyone happy. And it's hard for me to, I guess, understand that or wrap my head around that sometimes. And that stresses me out. But I guess some things that kind of help me are like what Aurora said, just doing nothing. Um, it's hard for me to just do nothing because I feel guilty about doing nothing. But that's one thing. Another thing, if I'm feeling really stressed out, I go and work out just because it clears my mind or I dance. It's, you know, dancing is a form of expression and a way to de-stress. So that's another um, little tool that I use. But yeah, it gets, you know, life gets stressful. I mean, no matter who you are. And I think that the more we talk about, um, I guess, being stressed or how you're feeling, the more we can actually deal with it and overcome those, those feelings. Yeah, and I think there's so many expectations, uh, like you talked about too, with imposter syndrome, like knowing yourself and then having everyone else see you in a different way um, and then trying to live up to all that. It's really, it's a challenge. Uh, and I think any college student right now, like outside of, of uh, everything else happening is, is going through a lot. Uh, Sydney, do you want to talk to us about some causes of stress that, that, that you have happening, some ways you cope with them? Yeah, definitely. I think everybody basically summed up what I'm going through, and I'm sure so many other students are going through as well. Um, you know, being in the middle of a pandemic has heightened so many different emotions for me, especially being a sexual assault survivor. So all the feelings that I used to feel have definitely been heightened more. And with just, you know, not being able to come in for lack, you know, in-person in therapy, for example, even that has its impact or not being able to go to class in person and seeing your support system. Um, so there has been different ways that I felt that my mental health has definitely been impacted. Um, and like what everyone, saw, everyone else said too about feeling guilty um, when you take time for yourself. And for me, that's been something that I've been working on really hard this semester, especially because I really felt burnt out with spring break not happening. And then being the president and co-founder of It's On Us at BU. So being in charge of that on top of being a senior and trying to look for jobs and doing well in classes, there's just so many things going through my head that when I'm not doing anything, I'm freaking out. I'm like, I'm very uneasy and I feel like I have to do something at all times. Um, so one thing I try to do to manage my stress level is to tell myself it's okay to take breaks when needed. It's okay not to feel guilty. It's okay not to get perfect grades all the time. Um, it's okay to get rejected from jobs. It's, it's okay to feel this way even though you're an activist um, because activism burnout is so real. And so just reminding myself these simple reminders has been extremely helpful for me. And to, at the end of the day, like find a support system, um, talk it out with my friends, go out if I need to. Um, these are all steps that I take that I found extremely helpful for me personally. Yeah, I, I mean, um, activism and mental health can't be separate things. Uh, oftentimes, 
when you're as passionate as all of you are about these causes, you put yourself uh, in that cause first. I'm sorry, you put the cause first, and then sometimes we forget, like, oh, I'm I'm actually an important part of this whole cause, and being able to balance activism with your mental health is is so critical. We started with the the question of of how do you cope with stress. We didn't get to the question of what is what is it, what is your journey with mental health and and what got you here. Nadia, you shared a little bit, uh, a, a snippet of your journey with mental health, the, um, you, you did as well. Does anyone wanna kind of expand on what your journey with mental health has been? None of us just get to a place of like, well, now we know how to cope without going through some struggles. So do you wanna share with uh, the, the, the audience some of the struggles you've had to, to get here? Anyone can jump in. I'm happy to to kick off. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, th this month is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Also, I, I have a lisp right now. I got um, braces two weeks ago, and so I'm relearning how to talk and, like, trying not to spit up on myself right now. Um, but, um, I mean, my mental health journey has been, like, I mean, it is lifelong, right? I grew up in New York City um, with a uh, like abuse at home and didn't really um, have legal accountability or knowledge of it until I was older because when you grow up with that kind of um, behavior in your house you think it's normal because that's all you know um, and uh, because of that you know I didn't have the healthiest of relationships when I you know hit my teen years and uh, my mental health journey has been you know working through a lot of PTSD and um, uh, I really actually related to what Mia was saying around working out and like physical movement being such a part of like a healing journey because with my PTSD comes from comes uh, depersonalization and dissociation, um, which means like my body learned to cope by like separating from my body, right? Like physically kind of feeling like an empty, like an empty shell. And so for me, like working out and movement is really one of the only things that can kind of recenter my my body and like feeling more present. Um, and, uh, you know, in the last year, like I think really trying to understand more about my depression and anxiety. Um, and uh, I recently got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which is really hard because it basically means that emptiness and self-doubt and imposter syndrome to an extreme are like part of my lived experience, right? And so I think that one of the things that I've uh, I've been really kind of in you know interested in learning more about or just ruminating and reflecting on my own life is a lot of borderline which I honestly like have I still get nervous talking about because it is so stigmatized. <laughs> um, like a lot of borderline is um, kind of being unsure of your own identity, right? And that's been a huge part of my own um, anxiety over the last few years because I think you know, as a Gen Z member and being a young entrepreneur from a really young age where social media was like how I grew my career, it's how I made my friends. Like, I think that all of us, when we are put onto social media platforms at like age nine or 10, we subconsciously are creating personal brands, right? Like making small decisions at every every step about how you present, what the tone of voice is, like literally a personal brand. And I think that one of the things that I've been really kind of um, really focusing on is really trying to spark through like what is work and what is Nadia? Like who am I when I take out that social media lens and I take out this idea of how I'm perceived by a brand? Because to be honest, um, where I hit my mental health rock bottoms is you know, growing up in this era of like hashtag hustle porn, right? And like glorifying burning out, right? And thinking that in order to be successful, you have to like burn out and be exhausted. And for me, it's been a really, really uh, like hard effort. And I'm still feel like I'm barely scraping the surface with it of really trying to feel valued and feel worthy um, when I am not in the context of work, right? And productivity, which I think are things that I'm having to dismantle a lot of like even, you know, capitalist, <laughs> patriarchal value structures that I've been conditioned by. But that's kind of a bit about my journey and like ongoing journey um, over the last 22 years. <laughs> uh, that's a good summary. Um, you know, and what I hear in your story too is like, 
you started from a place of trauma and that that trauma wires your brain in in such a powerful way and now you're trying to kind of do all the work to rewire that in a different place while your brain is maturing and you're taking on all these tasks and so that feeling of like validation from success or like appearance or accomplishment is so so tied to everything else you said and you know, I think that the thing that really stuck out to me the most is you're, you're, you're putting up boundaries now to protect yourself because you grew up in, in a traumatic boundary list situation. And that, that's so, so powerful. Uh, anyone else want to enlighten us with your own kind of mental health journey? Nia, you look ready to go. I just, oh, I guess I just wanted to add on to kind of what Nadia was saying about social media since, um, I think that it's a huge source of, I mean, I think that social media takes a huge toll on your mental health. Um, I know that growing up on social media, I've had a following for a while and no matter who's on social media, it's really hard to see people posting pictures of like living their best lives. And, you know, people only post the best aspects of their lives and never like the terrible moments, you know, you always see people doing their best. And I think that can be really hard on people like us who want to be the best versions of ourselves because you see other people doing and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to be doing more when you're really, you're doing fine. Um, and I think I just also wanted to add on about um, kind of what Nadia was saying, but being, having followers and being looked at as a role model on social media can be really hard on your mental health as well um because you're under a spotlight you're basically you know in a fishbowl and everyone's looking in and everyone has opinions on what you do with your life and if you say something that someone doesn't like whether it's right or wrong you can still you still feel that pain you know you still feel like people don't like you and you know on social media all you want to do is be accepted you just want to be liked and that's so hard for your, your heart, your mind, because you don't need to be liked by everybody. But for some reason, when you're on social media, you feel like you need to be liked by everyone. When in reality, would you really care if a random stranger didn't like you? No, no, you wouldn't. Um, so that's a one thing that I probably do struggle with a lot is just because a lot of, I would say like a lot of young girls and boys do look up to me and view me as a role model. And I'm very honored to, you know, be that person and I try my best to be the best role model I can but also I am a person and I have to remember to give myself time and, and breaks from social media especially since um, people have seen my whole life so they feel like they can say whatever they want about it um, or you know I feel like it's just really hard to say certain things or if you do something wrong or you feel like you have to be perfect all the time when in, you aren't perfect. People make mistakes. And if you make a mistake for some reason, everyone goes in on you. Depends on what the mistake is. If the mistake is terrible, then you should, there, there's consequences, but little mistakes even, <laughs> sorry, but like little mistakes that are made, like, I don't know, people call you out on them and you don't mean them or you say phrase things in certain ways and people don't understand social media can be really rough on your mental health. And I have to actually take social media breaks sometimes because it gets to a point where I can't handle it or I'm crying. And I'm like, this isn't, social media technically is not real. It's great. We can use it to inform people, to, to help encourage people, um, motivate people. But, you know, there's also, there's good and bad to social media. But I think at the end of the day, something that helps me with, I guess my mental health and staying sane is to kind of take breaks from social media because it can, it can be really hard on my mental health. Yeah. And, and also like not letting your social media presence define who you are, right? It's not who you are at all times, or even for Nadia, not letting any of the diagnoses or traumas define who you are. It's, it's the work you've put in to kind of become who you are from it. Right. Um, Social media can be such a double-edged sword. Aurora, Sydney, you want to share anything about your own journeys that, that got you here? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I think for me, it's taken a really long time to come to terms with the mental health um, issues that I'm going through. And I think this really stemmed from like my culture, my family, being from an Asian community, mental health is not really talked about 
enough. And it's a lot of a hush hush kind of conversation. Um, most times parents are often like ashamed if their kids have it, they feel like they're a failure as a parent or uh, such and such. So for me growing up, it's been really difficult because I knew ever since I was like, in, even in fifth grade that something wasn't right. I was extremely anxious and depressed as a kid and I needed help. And even when I told my parents about it, they would like, you know, just brush it, brush it down and be like, you're fine, you're fine, you don't need help, like you're okay. And they didn't want to admit that their child needed support and like professional help. Um, and so for so many years, it was honestly like an automatic response for me to inval invalidate my emotions because that's what so many people did to me growing up as a kid. So anytime I would have any other reactions, I would myself invalidate myself. And um, it wasn't until I went into therapy, um, finally for the first time my high school year, and realized how effective therapy can really be and to not have to talk about it with like family or close friends. And then on top of that, like after experiencing sexual assault on campus within three weeks of starting my freshman year, that's when I really started getting intensive therapy. And um, it really helped me come to terms with validating myself, which I think is such an important step because you're really breaking free from um, anything that's tying you down and telling you that you're at fault or you're to blame for, or you're just making this up for attention. All, all sorts of stuff like that. So um, I think that my journey has been really successful so far. And I'm really glad that I've been in this journey and have found the best therapist possible and a strong support system now. And I think it's important reminder that you also need to have like boundaries for yourself and even family. Um, my family sometimes don't understand where I'm coming from and that's okay, but I don't have to please them or I don't have to get their acceptance to... Um, come to terms with what I'm going through. Because at the end of the day, like I know what I'm going through. I know that my feelings are validated and these feelings are there for a reason. So um, I think my journey in general, yeah, has been really successful in that term. And just being able to break free and talk more about it has helped me, especially um, starting It's On SFBU especially has helped a lot in terms of communicating and connecting with other survivors. Um, there's such a beauty in that and being able to lean on each other when others don't understand you. So yeah, that's been really powerful. And that, that's quite a story too, Sydney, like um, just hearing that transition to college is already so difficult and then throwing a sexual assault in on top of it, like it's just such a challenge to, to find ways to even balance any of that. So like, you know, great job in finding advocacy as a purpose for that because it is terrifying. It's, it's devastating. So I'm glad you've been able to find ways to, to have outlets for that. Aurora, your your mental health journey, how's that How's that going? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, you guys, thank you so much for sharing so candidly. There's so many different things that I've gone through my mind while all of you were talking. And I think that, you know, I can relate to each of you on so many different levels. And I think, you know, I'm definitely probably the oldest panelist here and, and um, I'm 35, it's helpful for people to know. And, um, you know, through my 20s, it was crazy. It was exactly what you guys are talking about. I mean, there was like so much pressure. There was crazy things going on with friends. There was crazy things going on in like, you know, relationships, like it was a lot. And, you know, we've, we were all on social media. We were all trying to figure it out. We were all, you know, building these followings as well or getting upset because we weren't building followings, right? And, um, you know, some of my best friends, I mean, literally created the term girl boss. So it was like the hustle was like very real. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure. And I think, you know, I and a bunch of my friends got to the point where it was like, okay, what are we really working towards, right? Because we've all made ourselves sick at a certain point, literally, right? We're expending, especially when we talk about activism, because we are spending our emotional capital, right? I spent most of last summer puking almost every day because it was such a emo such emotionally taxing work talking about, you know, my identity and trying to fight for that and advocate for that, that it was physically causing me to throw up. I'm sure everyone who's listening has had some physical symptom of stress before, right? And we put all of this on ourselves. And at a certain point, I really had to go back to that quote that I'm forgetting who said it right now, but I think it's been paraphrased so many times, but it's like, you know, who were you before the world told you who you should be? 
And I think for me, it's been about spending so much time trying to get back to that, right? And when I think about why I want to work or why I want to stress or why I want to worry, I need it to be about things that truly make me happy. And that is a very different proposition than what the world tells me I need to be happy, right? I'm a shoe designer, so obviously I spend a lot of time selling shoes. None of us need any more shoes. That's a fact. We know that. It's painful for me to say, obviously, because that's my business, but it's very true. I don't want to stress to make money, to make a dress, or to raise money to buy more dresses or whatever. What I want more than anything else on the planet is freedom, and that is the most expensive thing to buy, next to impossible to buy. And actually, the only way to achieve it is by getting rid of the most expensive things that are in our lives, and oftentimes the most expensive things in our lives were brought to us as opportunities, right? So some of my friends will be offered jobs, or I'll be offered a job. And literally it's like, okay, like, do you want to do this job for like XYZ company? You know, this is the rate, it's a, it's a bunch of money. And my first thought is, gee, that sounds really expensive. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of time. That sounds like a lot of stress. That actually sounds like something I don't need in my life because while it'll make me more successful on paper or on social, I can't live my life for paper or for social because I can't afford to physically. I have one life and if my pursuit is freedom and happiness, then I probably need to not take that job that the whole world is telling me I should be working my entire life to take that job. You know, and so I think for me, how to cope with mental stress has been about really trying to zero back in on like, who am I? You know, when I came into this world and I was like a little girl and I was like laughing and I was happy and like my best friend in kinder was really excited about growing up to be a garbage man, you know, that's authentic. <laughs> like, that's a, like, that's authentic. I wanna figure out like, who am I supposed to be? What makes me really happy? And over the last, couple years, I've realized what makes me truly happy. And when I say happy, I mean it. Like those feelings where you're like, oh my God, this is almost euphoric, right? Truly happy is advocating for other people who are less privileged than I am. And what I also realized was that every time in my life that I've tried to do something for myself and worked myself sick trying to make it happen, when I actually stop trying to do it for myself and I try to do it for other people, the whole world breaks open with opportunity to be able to do that thing. And so if I can actually live my life in service of other people and only take as much as I need and not too much ever in any situation, just take what you need, that weight is going to be so much less. And we all have to figure out what our baggage is and sometimes what we're carrying that we think are our prizes are actually our baggage and what i'm hearing from 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 you know some of the other women on this call is like maybe our following sometimes is our baggage you know and maybe these things that we've been working so hard for like these awards or like these degrees or like these opportunities are really part of our baggage. And we need to be careful what we bring into our cocoons during this time when we're trying to protect ourselves because some of what we are kind of sheltering ourselves with is actually going to birth us into moths instead of butterflies. And really, you know, we need to be able to take true flight and show our colors and show the world who we are, but we have to figure out who we are first, if all of that makes sense. And I think for me, even my journey to get back to who I am, you know, before I felt like I had to be a girl boss, before I felt like I had to break through glass ceilings, before I felt like I had to be the youngest and the fastest and the smartest and the blackest, you know, like, I need to just figure out like who Aurora is right now. I mean, I don't have a mic drop emoji or anything, but like, <laughs> like it's just like. No, but it's true. <laughs> it's profound. You know? Like, my what, what I love about what you just shared. I did some stuff and I want to do less stuff because that feels good. You know, but what I, like, and, and, and I don't want I everyone about, to feel like they got to do stuff too. Like, I really want the girls on my timeline to be like, 
I got this job and it's great and it's cool, but more importantly, I'm going to have a picnic tomorrow and that's really exciting. I'm going to read this book because that's what makes me happy. You know, I don't want to be living this life that makes other people feel like they have to hustle and grind and all of that. The only thing you have to work towards is figuring out who you are and how you got here and, and how to relate to the people that are around you and how to have dinner with your friends when you're fully present. You know, what's the last time you looked someone in the eye for 10 seconds straight because you were listening that hard? I want to listen better. Listening makes me happy. <laughs> what, I, what I love about all of this, Aurora, is like how honest you were in your journey. So you, you started by sharing like, yo, I'm 35. But then you shared like the hustle you went through and now you're coming out of it in a couple of different ways. One, though, you're an artist, like, like mm -hmm. an artist, right? And in art, it is very easy to get locked into wanting to represent the African culture, like all the things that you do so beautifully, right? But then you, in that same artist mentality can lose touch with like the bigger perspective because you're so focused on hustling just to make it. So like the authenticity you just shared in just starting with your age, but then the journey you got to is, 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 is just so powerful and beautiful to hear. It's, it's inspiring and it's just real. Um, everything you just said could be like a quote that everyone listening wants to repeat and live by. Um, we could, I, we, you know, I could talk about all, all of those elements, but, but for all of you, that representation piece is so important. For all of you, that representation piece is bigger than you, but it gets tripped up in social media and, and all these other distractions. Like Aurora said, you only have one life, right? The, the next question I want to talk about is that, you know, It's On Us is focused on preventing sexual assault. And sexual assault is happening uh, on campuses and in this country in, in significant ways. And so I, I wanted to discuss kind of the mental health fallout you see from sexual assault in your own lives, in your friends' lives. And really, because so many people tune in and, and follow this organization, like, what are some things you've seen people be able to do or manage in, in terms of addressing it in the best ways that they can? Some of you have already shared your personal journeys with it, but I do want to leave people with like, okay, sexual assault's happening. How's it impacting people? What, what have you seen and, and what have you seen uh, that, that helps people get, get through it? Yeah. So, um, as mentioned earlier, go. I'm a survivor of sexual violence, and yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, cool. So, um, as mentioned earlier, I am a survivor of sexual violence, and so I was able to firsthand see what it's like for a survivor to go through this post assault. And for me, it was definitely not an easy time, just like so many other survivors. Um, and personally, for me, I was diagnosed with PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, and major depressive disorder. Um, in addition, I also developed an eating disorder and I was hypervigilant at all times. And it took a huge toll on me when it came to school, especially because being a freshman and being halfway across the world just to come to school here um, was already adverse enough, but having to face what just happened was just as difficult or more. And it made me feel more alone than ever. Um, it took such a huge toll on me and I never wanted to leave my room. I stopped socializing with friends, responding to texts or emails, showing up to classes. I was basically failing all my classes as well. And I remember just my mind and body kind of shutting down on me because it's just so difficult to wake up every day and get through each day when you're in so much pain and denial. And so I really do think reflecting back on what happened, um, the one thing that could have helped my journey and so many other survivors journey um, in terms of healing is to have a supportive group of people. And I always say whenever I share my experience is that more than the actual assault itself, it's what people's responses were when I disclosed to them that hurt me the most. I had friends tell me, you know, why didn't you just fight back? I can't check in on you because I'm getting pizza with a guy. If he didn't finish in you, you have nothing to worry about. Um, I also had a guy that I was seeing at the time from home tell me that he wasn't sorry I was assaulted. Um, and he said, if you don't think this won't change anything about us, and I don't know what to tell you before breaking things off with me just three days after. Um, even my family wasn't really there for me. They didn't want to speak to me. They didn't want me to come home for spring break. And so all of this, you know, you can imagine just 
hearing all these words coming out of people that you expect to be there for you and when they fail to do so, it can only hurt a survivor more. And I really think it's important for communities to start stepping up and becoming better at intervening when you see or hear something inappropriate. Most importantly, survive, supporting survivors at all times by respecting them and validating them. I mean, it takes so much courage for survivors to ever speak up. It's not something easy to do. And so many people still have hidden traumas that they don't want to share about because of how society reacts. But your only job really to do is to believe them no matter what. And that's where the power is. And I really hope that moving forward, more people can start understanding not only the power of believing survivors, but also the consequences that survivors have to go through. Um, and as painful as the assault was, the consequences falling after are just as painful and lifelong traumatic experiences that these people are gonna have to carry with for the rest of their lives. So um, yeah, just moving forward, I really hope that this is something that people can really start doing and implementing. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, and I think groups like it's on us are taking the steps to teach that too, because it, it seems like all of those awful responses you got are really common and people don't even know the harm they're doing. They don't know that the first step should just be believe these people, believe someone like believe them. Uh, any other experiences or tips that Nadia and Aurora, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that Sydney said, so I'm not going to um, kind of repeat, but I'll say the other thing that I really noticed, especially when I got to Harvard, was like, you have to do extensive sexual assault training. And I'll just say, I think that it is so like heartbreaking to realize that in our education system, we try to course correct for this by saying, okay, we're going to do all these trainings of how to deal with sexual assault or rape once you've experienced it, right? Or we're going to teach you how to be good bystanders, right? Like I remember when I first got to college, all the trainings were about how do you be a bystander? But never once did we go into a training about consent. Like never once was the message, don't fucking rape like don't don't do that like how do you acknowledge that and I think that it's something that we even see in media today and like I mean I've been seeing it all over my social media like how do you support like how do you be there as a bystander rather than well let's get to the root of this problem and like why do we live in a culture where people grow up and you know it, it's sort of this normalized aspect of let's deal with the symptoms rather than the cause and I think that that's why there is so much power in talking about um, stories, you know, when people do feel ready to do it, because I think a lot of, you know, sometimes why this happens is like, there isn't that fundamental education on like, what is consent and what does it look like to respect boundaries, right? And I think that the, the burden is always on the survivor who, who with a society that's accepting that it's already gonna happen, right? Like one in six women by the time they're 18, like experience rape, like that's ridiculous. And why is it that when you get to college, you don't have the consent training, you have the bystander training, right? And I think that that's something that we fundamentally really have to dismantle, like when we think about how we disrupt this. Yeah, a hundred percent. We start affirmative consent lessons at my school in sixth grade and what affirmative consent means and scenarios and playing it out and drilling it into them every single year for months at a time that affirmative consent is a part of a healthy relationship and a part of healthy sexuality so like it, it can happen schools can do it um and they can do it well before college because let's be honest if you were sexually assaulting someone in college you probably started some kind of behavior in middle school and high school and now you're doing it in college and as an adult it doesn't come out of nowhere um so that that education can happen for sure uh nia aurora anything you want to add to this ask this question I do not. Sydney sure. and Nadia said it perfectly. And yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. Um, I would agree. I mean, I think you guys kind of took the words out of my mouth and, 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 and elaborated even more than I could. And, you know, I totally agree that this is so often put on the survivor. And I think that we really need more systems in place 
at an early age to talk about this. And, you know, we need to figure out how we can mobilize um, to make sure that that becomes mandated. Yeah, 100%. And there, and there are ways to do it. There's legislative ways to do it. There's a lot of ways to do it. And schools that keep saying they don't have time, well, like you need to prioritize people's lives because like Aurora said, you only get one life and someone else can damage it quickly. And so let's let's get to the root of those causes. Um, I feel like this conversation could go on for hours. We were only given you know this this time with each other. So I do want to have all of you kind of wrap up with just one thing that you want other people to know uh, for their own kind of journeys in mental health. Something whether it's inspiring, just something inspirational you can leave them with. You've already said like I don't know books worth of inspirational things. But uh, just one thing you kind of want to leave the audience with uh, as we wrap up here. I mean, I would just say to everyone that like literally there's nothing that has happened in your life that should be able to prevent you from doing everything and anything that you want to do. And, you know, there were so many things that happened in my life starting at such a young age that you know, made me feel like for all intents and purposes, I was not worthy. I was not valuable. I was not the person that was going to go on to do the things that I've subsequently done or, you know, things that happened that would make me feel like, you know, I would not, I'm, I'm not lovable or I'm not this or I'm not that. And if I had have believed all of those voices in my head, I would not be where I am today. And I know that they're absolutely untrue. So the first thing that we have to do is to A, not believe those voices, and then B, work to figure out where those voices are coming from and understand that we are all collectively hearing them and we must all collectively transcend that together because it's a shared experience and we need to stop this cycle in our generation to the very best of our abilities. Thank you so much, Aurora. Uh, Nia, do you wanna leave some people with some, some inspiration? Yeah, kind of just going off of what Aurora said, um, something that like my mom and my Nana always said to me growing up is just know your worth. And I've taken that with me my whole entire life and it, got, it gets tough, um, but I think it's so important to know your worth, like what Aurora said, and to really um, be there for yourself and to show up for yourself because at the end of the day, it's your life and you need to live it the way that you want to. You know, you can't let other people define you or their words define you. At the end of the day, you have to do what makes you happy. Um, so yeah, um, I just want to encourage people to honestly do whatever inspires them or makes them happy. Because again, like we've said the whole time, you only have one life. So you have to make the most of it and you have to live it to, you have to live your best life. You have to live it to the best you can, you know? Um, so yeah. Thank you for that. Nadia? Um, I guess I'll just say, don't be too hard on yourself when it comes to mental health and self-care. Aurora kind of said this at the very beginning, but I feel like sometimes with self-care, like self-care, hashtag self-care has become such a whole commodified industry in and of itself that we are told like self-care is face masks and bubble bath. And for some people that might be it. For me, it's like taking a shower once a week and sleeping an adequate amount. And um, I think that if you can just be easy on yourself and know that mental health is an ongoing journey. And um, yeah, I think that, that that's been a reminder I just have to really remind myself of. Yeah, 100%, thanks for that. And uh, Sydney. Yeah, I agree with everything that everyone just said, but I think to close um, it up, healing is not linear and that's really important. Um, try not to compare yourself to people because you may be somewhere else compared to your friends or a role model that you look up to and everybody's journey is extremely different. Um, no one's journey looks the exact same. You all have your own stories to tell. You all have your own experiences where you may be doing really well, but some days it may look really bad as well. So don't be too harsh on yourself when that happens. And um, 
you have so much to yourself more than you know. And you're not only resilient and beautiful, but you know, I hear you, we all hear you. We appreciate you guys for coming and um, just thank you so much for everyone for having the conversation today. And, and thanks to all, all of you, like this was truly one of the best like conversations I've ever seen about mental health. Thank you for being so vul vulnerable and honest and real. I know to some of you are like, duh, this is just what I do, but it means so much to so many other people. And so thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy, but I can't, can't thank you enough. This was really, really powerful. Thanks. Hi everyone, um, Nadia, Nia, Sydney, Aurora, thank you. I can't express better than Ross just did. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you've shared today and the immense vulnerability and candor that you've all shown up with as part of this conversation. Ross, thank you as always for being a wonderful moderator and partner uh, to It's On Us and all of our mental health and wellness work that we're doing. Um, so folks know we do have um, a lot more coming this week with our spring week of action. Um, I'm going to actually post in the chat right now um, our link tree, uh, which will help link you up to the other events happening this week. Um, we have some meditation and wellness events happening. We have a couple of other presentations um, from our student leaders happening this week. So please check that out and tune into those events if you're available. Um, this is not the first conversation we've had on this issue. It will not be the last. Um, and I hope that we can bring some or all of you back for those conversations in the future. Um, I really appreciate, again, the work that all of you are doing. Um, again, if folks joined late or had to hop off early, this has been recorded uh, and we will be pushing it out uh, first thing next week um, after our spring week of action is concluded. So again, everyone, thank you so, so much uh, for joining us today.